Okay. Now, this compact integral effects test oil loop that we've developed, which is a 50% height scaled replica for a fluoride salt cooled high temperature reactor loop. So the scaling between the SIET facility here on the left, and this is the Mark I PBFHR design that we've developed. Now this is a pebble bed, fluoride salt cooled pebble bed reactor. The key thing in, in this design is that we also have passive safety so that you have confidence that even if all of your electricity is gone, that you'll still be able to remove decay heat after you shut down. It is actually very easy to turn off the fission reaction. When the reactors at Fukushima Daiichi, there were seismic sensors in the plant that noticed the earthquake before any human being ever noticed it. And they noticed that it was out of their tolerance or their bounds that they'd been set to. And so before anybody did anything, the computers started shutting down the reactors. The workers stayed calm because they knew Japanese power plants are designed to withstand earthquakes. The reactors automatically shut down within seconds but nuclear fuel rods generate intense heat even after a shutdown. So backup generators kicked in to power the cooling systems and stop the fuel rods from melting. So when you turn a reactor off, fission stops, but you have this decay heat. You have to manage that decay heat. The tsunami hit about an hour after the reactors were shut down. So fission was long gone by the time the tsunami came along, but the reactors were still managing decay heat that decay heat continued to build, heat was not being removed from the reactor, and why weren't they using the power from the reactor to run the pumps? Because the reactor had been turned off. The reactor was turned off immediately when the seismic sensors sensed the quake. So there was no reactor-generated power. In light water reactors, if you allow fuel to be uncovered and you allow it to heat up, the zirconium cladding will react with steam to form hydrogen. As the fuel overheats to temperatures where it begins to lose its physical integrity and have localized melting, in the chemical conditions that you have with water, highly oxidized conditions, cesium and iodine are very volatile and they, they evaporate out, form small, condense a small particle, Aerosols. and you have intrinsically high pressure. And so you therefore have physical mechanisms. A dispersion get, term. Yeah, that can mobilize cesium and iodine. Now we designed the reactors to make that very unlikely. Yeah. Uh, through a combination of highly reliable cooling systems, passive systems are better than active, as we learned at Fukushima. But the physical mechanism remains. The physical mechanism remains. Whereas in a salt reactor. In a salt reactor, cesium, there's nothing that cesium loves more than fluorine. And it will, it will, it will compete with anything else to grab a hold of fluorine. And cesium fluoride is very, very low volatility and very high solubility in salt. So no aerosols. This is the uh, Watts Bar plant. Up here is where all the control rods slide in and out of the core. And then there's these four steam generators. You can see the steam generators at Watts Bar are as big, if not bigger, than the reactors. And they also have to operate at these very high pressures. Now, there's four of them. Look at that. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Big pipes. The number one accident people worry about with this kind of reactor is what's called a double-ended pipe break. One of these eight pipes, for whatever reason, shears. And all of a sudden, pressure is lost in the reactor. Steam doesn't uh, take away heat nearly as well as liquid water does from a surface. So all of a sudden, your fuel rods are not being cooled nearly as effectively as they were before. Now, fission will stop because one of the things the water is doing, it's slowing down the neutrons. So without the water, the fission reaction stops. You don't have to put control rods in or anything. The reactors, it will turn off immediately. But the containment building, I mean, look. Look at the size of the reactor. Look at the size of the containment building. It's huge. It's much, much, much bigger than the reactor. And that's all driven by that thousand to one difference in the density between steam and liquid water. This building is the size it is, and it's the way it is, precisely to accommodate this event. They've designed this reactor so if this happens, all the steam is captured in this building. A design basis accident for a pressurized water reactor that is evaluated in which we believe the reactors can respond safely is what's called a large break loss coolant accident. You could think about going to a real big pressurized water reactor, the real thing, getting high explosives, strapping it onto the cold leg of the reactor, and blowing that, like, the take the pipe apart. 
and, and do the test. Um, there's a number of reasons why that's just a bad idea. And the best way once we're getting into rather severe conditions is to make use of simulations validated by scaled experiments. I think that would surprise people though to realize that the best way to simulate a fluid is with a different fluid, not with the same fluid. Because your first impression would be, if I want to simulate water, I should use water. Yep, yep. But if you want to do a scaled effect, that's not the case. If you went back to the 1960s and asked how were you going to put in place a system to reliably provide cooling under emergency conditions where the normal shutdown cooling system is not functioning. Really the only practical way to do that was to use active systems with redundant and diverse components and power supplies and all of that. That was, that was the reason we ended up with the Gen 2 approach to active safety and South Korea, Japan, France, you know, there's lots of countries that, that are still stuck there, right? And the United States, we're the one country that really has developed the capability to do something much more sophisticated in terms of validating models for the reliability of passive safety systems and therefore to be able to shift towards using systems that do not require electrical power. And now you're going to see for molten salt reactors, there's this amazing thing we can match the behavior of molten salts in terms of convective heat transfer using heat transfer oils. Okay. And we can put up to 10 kilowatts of heat into this loop, which in salt would be equivalent to half a megawatt okay. of heat. Because which is a scaling relationship between the oil and the salt. It's very convenient. Was the, it just kind of dumb luck that it happened to be so favorable in that direction? It makes you believe there must be a higher power that <laughs> has sometimes every now and then smiles down on us. Is there a student who approached you and showed you some calculations? Because I don't think anybody's yeah. done this before. Philippe Bardet, he's an assistant professor at George Washington University now. He came into my office and said, you know, I was just looking at the properties here and the Prantelt number of this oil matches the Prantelt number of salt and re realized that in fact we could match simultaneously all of the key non-dimensional parameters that come out of the energy equations. This technique then is developed right here at Berkeley. Nobody's it was invented this. here, yes. At moderate temperatures around 80 degrees centigrade, heat transfer oils like Dowtherm have the same Prandtl number as Flybe does at 650 degrees. And if we scale to about 50% geometric scale, and if we accelerate time, we can match Grashoff, Reynolds, Froud, and Prantelt number, which means convective heat transfer can be the same. And this has huge implications because you'll notice that in the CF facility, we can instrument extensively. So really the big goal of this machine here is to simulate how decay heat is removed from this design when there's a shutdown. That is correct. Also, you learn a lot. For example, if you get bubbles trapped in the system, which when you fill things, you generally do, they can change the behavior. So in this loop, we've got lots of transparent locations where we can see bubbles and where we can vent them from the high places so that we can get all of the uh, trapped gases out once we've filled it. Well, it's really important when you design the salt system also to make sure that it's not going to have high points that are going to trap gas in ways that you didn't expect up at 600 degrees centigrade, yeah. it's a different environment in terms of you know, instrumentation. Transparent pipes and so forth. Yeah, th transparent pipes um, are Things tough to do. you can stand next to. <laughs> you might get little windows in. You can put flybe into a test tube and heat it up and melt it and you can see it, but you can't build glass, yeah, can. yeah. glass molten salt loops. That's, that would be bad. <laughs> well, they'd probably break.